Greetings, I'm Frederick, the Micro Hobbyist. In this third episode, I'm accelerating the pace by installing Flash, RAM, Decode Logic, and a few lines of code. Take out your breadboards, as it's time to unleash the 6309. In the previous video, I covered the basics, power, reset, the quadrature clock, and testing the CPU from schematic to breadboard. Today's episode is all about taking our project to the next level. We have a full agenda, refining the clock, integrating memory, implementing decode logic, programming a few essential lines of code, and finally bringing everything together on the breadboard. Let's not forget testing it with a logic probe and an oscilloscope. It's a comprehensive session where we delve deep into each component, enhancing our retro computing project step by step. I'm thrilled to see the positive response to the new format, so it's here to stay. A huge thank you to all my subscribers for your encouraging feedback. Your support motivates me to keep delivering great content. Let's start by focusing on integrating the clock stretching circuit, essential for future use with slower peripherals when overclocking. The datasheet calls for a 74LS74 D flip flop, but I'm opting for an HCT variant for consistency with the rest of the circuit. Also, I did not have any 3 input NAND gates on hand, so I made do with a 4 input 74HCT20. The circuit operates as follows. An external low signal on MREADY is inverted and fed into the 4 input NAND gate, along with the pre inverter clock signals from the JK flip flops. When all NAND inputs are high, its output goes low, triggering a reset to the first JK flip flop and setting the second one. This results in the Q clock signal being low and the E clock signal being high. The states persists until MREADY is deasserted, after which E and Q gradually return to their normal states. The CPU's address and data buses are now connected to various other devices, integrating the CPU more deeply into our system. The active low reset pin is integrated into the reset circuit. The three active low interrupt inputs, namely NMI, IRQ, and FIRQ, are each connected to a pull-up resistor pack. The HALT input pin is also linked to a pull-up resistor. The E and Q quadrature clock signals interface with the clock circuit. The active high TSC pin is attached to a pull-down resistor. The read-write output signal is currently interfaced with the glue logic chips and all other outputs are, for now, left disconnected. Shadow RAM, a technique originally employed to enhance system performance by transferring BIOS routines from a slower ROM to a quicker RAM at startup, has become less crucial in modern computing due to technological advancements. However, my approach to utilizing Shadow RAM is more selective and practical, it involves strategically copying only the necessary code into RAM, thus creating a dynamic map that optimizes the balance between the actual ROM code and the available RAM space. How does this circuit function? The arrangement of NAND gates depicted here forms what is known as an active low SR latch. Essentially, when the reset signal is asserted, the ROM select signal, in combination with the memory request signal, will enable ROM chip select. Conversely, when the ROM disable is triggered, it will activate the RAM select signal, coupled together with the read signal, will activate the RAM output enable. It's important to note that triggering the ROM disable signal makes the ROM inaccessible until the next reset. Hence, it's essential to shadow copy the ROM data to RAM before disabling the ROM. 
With this setup, I'm utilizing flash memory instead of traditional EEPROM. I may, in the future, implement some sort of inboard reprogramming of the flash. Currently, a 128K chip is used, but there's a potential to upgrade to a 512K flash for paging ROM data if necessary. For added versatility, it's mapped to a 64K space, for now. The RAM employed is a standard static type, boasting 512K capacity. While it's not fully addressed at the moment, plans are in place to page the remaining capacity in a future episode. Similar to the flash memory, the RAM is also mapped to a 64K space for the time being. I prefer using programmable logic devices in my projects for their flexibility and space-saving advantages. PLDs allow easy reprogramming for iterative design, combining multiple logic functions into one chip. I use WinCouple, a specialized software for PLD programming, to create and modify logic functions and connections. The first PLD, an ATF22V10C chip, is programmed to define a custom memory map and control logic. It has 16 input pins for clocks, read-write control, and address lines. It has 7 output pins for memory ranges and control signals. The programming includes defining a 16-bit address field and logic for read-write operations, active memory, I.O. requests, and vector ranges. The second PLD focuses on specific I.O. operations, with 13 input pins for clocks, read-write control, and an 8-bit address for I.O. operations. Its only output, for now, is the ROM disable signal, activated under specific conditions. Future expansions include serial and parallel ports, interrupt controllers, and other functionalities. The code sets up the system's operation, including disabling interrupts, configuring the CPU mode, and shadow copying ROM content to RAM. It also defines vector tables for handling various interrupts. The main loop for testing employs a branch always instruction, taking three cycles to execute with opcode hex 20 and operand hex fe. This pattern ensures bit 0 consistently stays low, providing a stable reference, while bit 5's extended high state of two cycles aids in timing analysis. The other bits are high for one cycle each, demonstrating the instruction's impact on the data bus activity. This is crucial for verifying proper CPU and memory interaction with a simple oscilloscope or logic probe. Time to test the design on the breadboard. The setup includes unchanged power, reset and quadrature clock from the last episode. I've replaced the CPU with the clock stretching circuit, added the flash, RAM, and the first PLD on the second row, the CPU, shadow circuit, and second PLD occupy the third row. All control signals, address, and data buses are connected. Upon activating the circuit, the power LED illuminates, the reset briefly lights up, Probing the ROM chip select pin after pressing reset shows the expected oscillation before remaining high. The ROM disable pin, when probed, stays high after reset, briefly toggles low, then remains high indefinitely. The RAM output enable pin, upon reset, behaves as expected, staying high, then oscillates after the ROM disable pin has been triggered. This confirms our shadow copy circuit and code are functioning properly. Probing the data bus, we observe bit 0 stays low, bits 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7 alternate between high for one clock cycle and low for two, bit 5 is high for two clock cycles and low for one. Comparing these to the clock reference on an oscilloscope, we see expected patterns, despite some overshoots and ripples. These anomalies are due to uncalibrated equipment, unconnected gate inputs, 
and inherent breadboard limitations, but the voltage levels are within logical ranges. Thank you for joining me on this journey. I've had a blast working on Logic Spark 09 so far, although I still think I'm spending way too much time editing, but the production value is probably worth it, and hopefully you found it engaging. Let me know. I know I'm not too quick responding to comments, but I get to them. In summary, we've added key elements to our retro computer, such as improving the clock, adding memory, and decode logic. We also coded a very basic assembly program that shadow copies the ROM to RAM and did a single one-liner loop. Theory was put into practice and all the tests were successful. Up next, we're going to integrate an ACIA with a USB interface to communicate with a modern computer. Excited about what lies ahead? Like, subscribe, hit the notification bell and brace yourself for the upcoming episode of 6309 Unleashed, 8 Bits and Beyond.